We greet you in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our Savior, but he is also all everybody's Lord, all persons' Lord. It says, For when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When did Jesus assume the authority over all flesh? Immediately upon his resurrection and ascension. So we see that we are studying now in the book of Matthew chapter 28, especially in verse number 19, the first three words, Go ye therefore. Now the word therefore has to throw us back to verse 18. For therefore means for this reason. Go ye for this reason. Or it means consequently, that we are consequently uh, reminded to go back and study verse 18 as to why we are to go. And it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given me in heaven and in earth. Uh, let me read it right. And when he had worshipped, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I did get it right. Go ye therefore, because all power has now been given me in heaven and in earth, I am absolute Lord over all things and over all people. So you go with that consciousness, and we usually take Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, and put them on a banner, or we broadcast them as, and we preach them as our great commission. It is a great commission, but if you leave out verse 18, which the word therefore refers you back to, you may have a great commission, but you left out the great commissioner. That's who you are to be in consciousness of, not just the poor lost sinner, but with the Holy God who sent you unto those sinners, who is himself Lord over heaven and earth. And then we took you last time we studied this to John chapter 17 and looked at the great prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is praying to the Father. The Holy Son of God has ordained that we, by the Holy Spirit, copy down his words and the circumstances when God the Son was praying to God the Father. And listen at the three things that we brought out as to God's priority concerning Christ's cross. He said, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. He began to have a heavenly consciousness and said, Father, the hour is come. What hour is that? The hour that God had ordained before the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ should come and die at this particular time in this particular place. And these are the things that the Trinity had determined should take place. There are three things, and they should be left in their order. The first thing that was to be accomplished at the cross of Christ, Father, the hour is come, Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Enable me to accomplish all that you have ordained me to do, that I might bring glory to thy name. By redeeming all those that you chose in me from the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. So number one, what is, the, uh, what is the purpose of the cross and what is the order? Number one. The glory of God. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Number two, John 17, 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh. The second purpose of the cross was to promote the Lord Jesus Christ to absolute sovereign over all flesh. Wicked flesh, unregenerate flesh sanctified flesh, born-again flesh, all flesh of all creation is under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what he said. The Bible said that Jesus made himself obedient to uh, death 
even the death of the cross in Philippians chapter 2. And then it says, Wherefore, because of that, <coughs> excuse me, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Ephesians 2 9. Nope, Philippians 2 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Acknowledging, recognizing, and worshiping the person of Jesus of Nazareth as Lord glorifies the Father. So Jesus prayed, John 17, 1. The first purpose of the cross is to glorify God. Number two, the second purpose of the cross is to, uh, for Jesus Christ to attain power over all flesh, to be exalted above every name in this world and in the worlds to come. And then number three, the third and final thing. It's not left out, but it's not the primary thing. These other two have to go first in order for this one to be. That's why we cannot leave out Matthew 28, 18. All authority is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Go ye because of this. Go ye in, in order to bring this uh, about. So in, in order that this be brought about and you see that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. For this reason you should go. So the third thing is in Matthew 7. I'm going to get things right today, folks. Listen. John 17 and verse 2. That he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. All of God's elect people are given to Christ from the Father. Jesus said on down in this passage in John 17, All thine are mine. <clears throat> What does that mean? He's talking to the Father. All thine in sovereign election are mine for completed redemption. I will save every one of those for whom you have chosen. So all thine are mine, and all mine that I redeem were only thine in eternal election. And then verse 3 of John 17. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the order of priority as listed by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in his prayer to God the Father at the very distinct and unique hour of his crucifixion leads you to understand the therefore in Matthew 28, 19. It doesn't say, go ye. It says, go ye therefore, go ye for this reason. For what reason? Because all authority is given me in heaven and in earth. We should have a Christ consciousness concerning evangelism. But because preachers have refused to read Matthew 28, 18, and they omit the word therefore, they read right over it, but they don't have any uh, exposition of it as to what it means. Go ye for this reason. We are not to look at the sinner and say, poor old sinner, we need to get you saved. We can't save anybody. And if you look at the poor old sinner, you are putting him above the importance of glorious old God. So you wind up with an occult of soul winning and you leave that which God has ordained, that is the church who is involved with the Spirit's soul saving. Why does God call it the foolishness of preaching? Because preaching never saved anybody. Now God uses preaching. Our air conditioning is out. That's the reason I don't have on a jacket and that's the reason I'm wiping my face. But that's all right. God says it's the foolishness of preaching that God used and ordained to save them that believe. You mean they believe and then the, the foolishness of preaching is used to save them? That's what it says. 
It says, as many as God had ordained to eternal life, he saved. That's the way it's supposed to be. You need to have a God consciousness and not a poor old sinner consciousness concerning uh, evangelism. Acts 13 and verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Listen. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Those who were ordained, chosen, elected by God unto eternal life were those that he granted faith and repentance. They believed. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord... You must understand Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. So we see that Matthew 28, 19, the third word in that verse, is extremely important. It is the word therefore. It means for this reason. For the reason that I have just told you. What is that reason? All authority, all power, all jurisdiction is given unto me, in heaven and in earth. Do you know of any other places other than heaven and earth? Well, Jesus Christ is Lord in all those places. And we are to have a consciousness of the Lordship of Jesus Christ as we go to evangelize. So this is what we have been looking at. Let me show you another passage in Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And this is uh, just like the, quote, Great Commission. And they leave out verse 18, just like the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. This passage is often quoted concerning the the redemption and salvation of the lost. But they leave out verse 10. They quote to you or read to you or preach to you on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But what about verse 10? Leaving out verse 10 of Ephesians 2 is just as detrimental and it will uh, affect our evangelism as much as leaving out verse 18 of Matthew 28. Let's read these verses. They're very familiar verses to you. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, period. That's far as it goes. We're just talking about you. We're just talking about you getting saved. And those words are true and they're good. But, again, if you quote what you call the Great Commission and only quote Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and you leave out verse 18, you leave out the commissioner, the one who sent you. He will give you authority as to what you can do and can't do, as to where you can do and can't do it, as to when you can do and can't do it. He is in control of all things. You are flesh, so he is in control of you too. Those who are sent are under the authority of Jesus Christ as much as those to whom they are sent. He is in control. Let's read verse 10 of Ephesians 2. Uh, We read verses 8 and 9 often quoted. Listen at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now, he is relating grace and and, and, uh, uh, faith uh, as the gift of God and and, and the works that are not uh, not of works. You're not saved by your own works, but you're saved by the the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, listen, unto good works. It's not without good works, but the good works follow. They don't precede. When you have grace and faith at work, in a sinner's heart, then he will then begin to live in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, and he will bring forth the good works. Listen listen what it says. 
that God hath ordained that we should walk in them, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do you understand what that means? He's saying that there are good works that God hath before elected, that God hath before chosen, that God hath pre in, in past times ordained, that everyone that's saved will live like this. They will act like this. You can't get them to act any other way because old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And it says in this verse 10 that it, that is by Jesus' uh, ordination and it is by his creation. We, being born again Christians, are creations of Jesus Christ. And it is the same as if God spoke and created the world. We, like the heavens and the earth before, were in darkness. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, that's the word, let there be light. And there was light. That's the same thing that happened, and that's the same way that Jesus Christ saves a soul. He's in darkness. He's walking in the kingdom of darkness. But God's word speaks sovereignly. Not the preacher's word. Not just reading the Bible. Not just giving a tract. These things may be included, but they are never the effectual word that saves the sinner. The effectual word that saves the sinner is the same word that was spoken in Genesis chapter 1, let there be light, and there was light. God speaks life unto his ordained and his chosen and the Father's elected sinners. These works were ordained as much as the sinner who is chosen in God was ordained to be born again. You can't separate them. That's the way uh, that, that it is. Look at Romans chapter 8, the book of Romans, chapter 8, and verse number 29. You know Romans 8, 28. You quote it all the time, don't you? We know all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Now listen, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow... Dear soul, there was a pre-foundation, pre-creation work of God concerning your salvation if you're saved. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate, marked it out ahead of time that it would be this way, to be conformed to the image of his Son. God has ordained that everyone that he saves Every sinner that is born again will bring forth these good works that are the workings of the eternal Son of God who has been invested within the soul of the sinner. He says, For whom he did predestinate, whom he did predestinate to be the conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus is the pattern. Jesus is the firstborn, and all we are like him. We are made in his image. When God said, let there be, there was life. Lazarus, come forth. He that was dead came forth. That's a picture of the dead sinner coming forth from darkness and, and from, from corruption into life and light. And so we see that this verse, uh, Ephesians 2 10 is absolutely essential to seeing how the things work in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through, first, through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Why? Because we are brought forth by Jesus Christ in an effectual, sovereign word, just like he brought forth the earth and creation at the beginning. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Second Peter chapter 1. 
2 Peter chapter number 1. Verse number 8. For if these things be in you, what things? You can go back up there and read them. Add to your faith, verse 5, virtue, that's power. To your power, add some knowledge. To knowledge, adds temperance. To temperance, add patience to patience. Add godliness to godliness. Add brotherly uh, kindness to brotherly kindness. Add love. Now, Peter said, if these things, these good works be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can have head knowledge and still be lost. You can say the words, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. The, devil, the demons do too. But if these works are in you, it means that God has created in you that which is like unto Christ. And all of these spiritual qualities will be in your character. Look down at verse number 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. How can you make your calling sure? If you're called by God effectually, you will come to him. Zacchaeus come down. He came down. Lazarus come forth. He came forth. But how do you make it sure? But there's even one more that you can make sure. Make your calling and election sure. Wait a minute. You wasn't there when you were elected. There was no angels there when you were elected. Nobody was there when you were elected except God Almighty. Well, how in the world are you going to make your calling and election sure? He says in verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 1, If ye do these things, ye shall never fall. You will never fall from grace. You will never fall into sin. You will never fall into darkness. You will never fall into total eternal damnation and destruction. So these things, quality of ca uh, spiritual character, if they are found in you, then you have assurance of your calling and your election. You are created in Christ Jesus. Dear soul, you must look back to Christ. You must look up to Christ. You must use those things that God has given you to examine yourselves in. That's what we find in John chapter 3 and verse number 18 and, and following. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now listen. And this is the condemnation. This is that which will condemn you. That light is come into the world. Let there be light. And there was. Let, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Listen. Because their deeds are evil. Because they don't have these good works in them. You can quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 all you want to, and people can still stay dead in trespasses and sins. You can be the one who quotes Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and still remain in sin. You can get up and preach Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and still remain in sin. But dear soul, you need to include verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and that which God creates works and that which God creates is that which he had ordained it to be let there be light there was light so this light that has come into your life it is a condemnation to you if you remain in darkness now listen at verse 20 of John 3 for everyone no exception for everyone that doeth evil Hateth the light, 
How do you relate to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you hate it? Then your deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Why? He don't want his deeds to be reproved. He don't want people to know what a sinner he is. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth, in other words, you are acting out those things that God has acted in you. Those things we saw of love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and long-suffering, all those things, brotherly kindness and so forth and charity, those things in you, the virtue and all, if, if those things are manifest uh, in you, that, that, that is your light to prove that those deeds cannot be wrought or manifested by religion or by joining the church or by being baptized or by buying a Bible or by listening to preaching. Those works, those deeds of righteousness can only be had if Jesus Christ has fitted you with the doing of truth. Not just the knowing of truths, but the being in the truth. And by doing those truths, wherein you know that this is not the way I used to think about life. This is not the way I used to think about sin. This is not the way I used to think about righteousness. The Bible said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then it adds, and seek ye first the righteousness of God. And then all these other things will be added to you, John Matthew 6, 33. So when we are in the born-again spirit of grace and faith, we see these gifts of, uh, of, of Christian character, uh, that is Christ living in us. And we know that this didn't come from the birth that we had from our mother. This came from a birth that we had from the Spirit. Galatians chapter 2. The book of Galatians chapter 2. Verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. I did not see him crucified. But what he's talking about is that the Holy Spirit has come within me and he does two things. He makes dead the old man and the flesh and he makes alive the new man and the spirit. So I have to have two things done in me. Dying to my flesh and being made more alive in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I am crucified with, flesh, uh, with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm not physically dead. That's not what I'm talking about. My crucifixion is a spiritual thing. It is a matter of mortification, of God mortifying, making dead my old man, and making me alive in the newness of, of life in regenerated life in Jesus Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, that which is living now is not the old me, and in fact it's not me living in a new way. What is more correct is Christ liveth in me. That is the only definition and description of a true born-again believer. He or she is one in whom Christ is living, through whom Christ is manifesting himself. To do that, the, old, the, the, the believer has to be dead, has to be mortified, has to be crucified with Christ. It's, it's made dead. Get out of the way. Stay dead that Christ may resurrect you and live through you. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, it's me, I'm still, you know, the son of so-and-so, mother and daddy, and, 
I'm still the same one, got the same f fingerprints and social security number. It's still me. I'm still living here, as you see me, not in the old uh, uh, adage of the fleshly man, but here in the natural man, I'm still alive. And he says, and the life which I now live here in this flesh, as you see me, I live by the faith, watch it, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, it doesn't just say by the faith in the Son of God, and that's absolutely true. You have to have faith in Christ. But so this is even more uh, in depth. This is the faith of Christ. Christ's faith. Christ's life. Christ's cross. Christ's crucifixion. Christ's resurrection is that which I have to have in order that I might live and manifest the spiritual man in Jesus Christ. The, flesh, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So he died that I might live. And now since he died in my place, I owe him my life and I need to stay out of his business and stay out of his way and stay dead and stay crucified with Christ that he might live through me and manifest himself to the world. So we see, dear soul, that if you leave off Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, you omit all these glorious things about the commander who commanded us, our commissioner who commissioned us to go ye. But he didn't commission us to go ye, period. He said, go ye Therefore, in consequence to this, go ye therefore for this very reason. So I am to go with a consciousness of the presently reigning Lord. That alone is true, spiritual, godly evangelism. Now we have got it down to a science. We have got phone banks. We have got emails, we have got everything lined up, and we know how to professionally advance towards these sinners. But dear soul, the thing about it is, you can't save them, and your program won't save them. Only the Holy Spirit applying Jesus Christ to their souls can save them. One of the reasons I know that, of course, is by the scriptures that I've just tried to expound to you. But the other reason is I was a lost church member for seven years. I followed my older brothers down an aisle in the First Baptist Church in Eufaula, Alabama. And I still have the little New Testament that they gave me when I was baptized. But for seven years... I was a church member. I was even the president of my Sunday school class, whatever that is. I sang in the youth choir. I was considered to be a good, moral young man by the people of that church in southwest Atlanta. When we came to southwest Atlanta, but one day the Holy Spirit came to me and made me know two things. Number one, that my confession was no good before God and that the church could not save me, only Jesus could. It scared me so bad, I was afraid to go to sleep that night. I was afraid that if I went to sleep, I would wake up in hell. And I could not wait to confess with my mouth that God had saved me. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And you won't get the peace that you, that you need. You won't get the peace of God until you confess him with your mouth. But you will only confess him uh, with your mouth because of that which your heart contains. For out of the abundance of the 
heart, the mouth speaketh. And so I was able to stand in front of that second church as a redeemed child of God. I had not at that time been dealt with by the soul winning occult and coaxed to come down an aisle when I didn't know what I was doing. They said, you are saved. Here's your New Testament. You know, we'll write in at the date and tell you this is when you got saved, so you'll never doubt it. I did doubt it because it was doubtful. And God showed me that that, that system, that program, had failed me greatly. And if God had not interrupted me, I would have been one of those wherein Jesus said, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Thank God for salvation. This is why that God has helped me to see that Matthew 28, 18 is absolutely essential to quote the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And by his marvelous wisdom, he put this one word in there. And it says, because of this reason ye are to go. Why? Because all authority is given me in heaven and in earth. It's not your authority. Well, we're to go out every Thursday night and knock on doors and, and witness to people. We're good for you. But you've got to understand, if you're not sin of the Lord... And if you are not attended by the Lord, and if those souls that you are speaking to do not have their hearts opened by the Holy Spirit, you are sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. The absolute sovereignty of Jesus Christ precedes go ye. And the absolute sovereignty of Jesus Christ follows by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It goes on to say, we are his workmanship. Created. The sinner saved is a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Lazarus, you're no longer dead. Lazarus, you no longer stink. Lazarus, you no longer have to stay in the graveyard. Come forth into light and life. And he did. So we must see these things and understand that this is exactly what God is telling us about. Look with me to James chapter 2. The book of James. Chapter number 2. James chapter 2. Verse number 18. Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. What does that mean? If you say you have faith, but you're still living like the old man, these new works, these good works that have been ordained by God that everyone who is born again will have, they are the fruit of the Spirit. Every man that is born again has these works and we'll walk in the pattern of the faith of Jesus Christ. It cannot miss. It will always be that way. Even so, faith, if it doesn't have these works, is dead being alone. Faith must be accompanied with the works that God has before ordained. In order that you may come to the light and see that my deeds are those things that are worked in God. I didn't used to like this. I used to make fun of this. I used to live in darkness and liked it because my deeds were evil. I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing. But now I come to the light to make sure and examine myself to see whether I be in the faith so that I might see that these works are now the works of Jesus Christ living in me. That's what he's talking about. Verse 18, James 2, 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, but I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. You can't do it. And I will show thee my faith by my works. If you have love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering, 
all of those things. If you have virtue and praise and power and brotherly love and charity, all of those things working in you, Peter said, that's how you make your election sure. Because every one of God's people have them. Thou believest there is one God? Well, good for you. The devils in hell believe that too, and they tremble. Now, I don't think I've ever seen you tremble. Thou believest that there is one God? You got that faith? We stand up and we read the, the Apostles' Creed. Oh, we, we quote some confession of faith. And then we sit back down as bad a sinner as we were when we stood up. Listen, thou believest that there is one God? We believe in, you know, one God and his son, Jesus Christ, and so forth. That's great. Thou doest well. That's, just, that's sarcasm. Thou doest well. The devils also believe that and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You can't say, I am a Christian and act like the devil. If you're acting like the devil, then you've got a demon. But if you are acting out the faith of the Son of God, then you are a born-again Christian. What does the word Christian mean? Little Christ. So we see these works prove that you are born again, and therefore we must remain in a, a knowledge and a consciousness that we will never separate Matthew 28, 18 from Matthew 28, 19, and 20 because you leave out the commissioner who sent you forth with this commission. And you understand that salvation and evangelism, those who are sent and those to whom they are sent, is absolutely under the sovereign control of Jesus Christ. Dear soul, I want to tell you something that I have found out by experience. Buying a, buying a plane ticket will not make you a missionary. If you're not a missionary right there where you are, on that street where you live in America, buying a plane ticket to Bolivia or wherever is not going to make you a missionary. When you get off that plane, you'll still be without uh, the call of the mission field as you were before you got on it. It's the call of God in your soul, the sovereign Lord. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You can't stay here. I've got a burden for these people. I need to go. I have to go. But our, our missionaries, they want to get all the money they need before they go. It ain't by faith. They go on deputation, whatever in the world that is. But dear soul, if the Holy Spirit called you, you can't help but to go and God will provide for you. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is a dead faith? It's a demon faith. The demons believe and tremble. It's a dead faith. There's no life to it. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See thou how faith wrought with his works. And by works, faith was made perfect. When did God tell Abraham to stay his hand? When did God, excuse me, tell Abraham, now I know that thou lovest me? It was not until Abraham had raised that knife against his son. He had to complete that work for God to see and him to prove to God that he genuinely had faith. So we see this is what the apostle is talking about. So there has to be the work of God, the Holy Spirit, within us and the Lordship of Jesus Christ guiding us so that we might have the right idea and concept and spirit to obey the Great Commission. You can't obey the Great Commission if you don't know the Great Commissioner. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 17. 
No, verse number 7. Matthew 15 and verse number 7. Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias, or that is Isaiah, prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, that is sadly the description of the majority of the evangelism of the church in America. It's just lip service. They hadn't been sent. They don't have the leadership of the sovereign Lord. They don't have the true burden for the souls that God is sending them to. And as I told you the last time, we were sent out on every Thursday night. We meet together and they'd give us our cards the visitors had signed us on the past Sunday, and they said, now go to all these houses, knock on all these doors, and invite them to our church, but your, your, your responsibility is to try to get them saved. And we did what the pastor and sister pastor said. We'd go and knock on doors, and dogs would start barking at us, and the TV would be on, and the people would be sitting there eating their supper on on TV trays and they didn't want to stop eating supper and they didn't want to turn off the TV and they didn't want to call off the dog and if you think you can save people or get people saved or even give them an idea of salvation in that circumstance you are sadly mistaken and going through all that and we did it and we didn't complain we kept on trying every week but one Thursday night after a particularly hard time of visitation coming back to the church to turn my cards back in and give my report I saw the pastor and the assistant pastor sitting at the Waffle House drinking coffee and I thought wait a minute if they think it's that important for me to go why don't they go and I find that there's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people that want to say, you're not evangelizing like you should. They want to load you up with guilt, and they want to afflict you with guilt in front of others and make themselves look good, and you look bad. But dear soul, the Christian is not to be governed by guilt or by pity. We're to be governed and ruled by the Holy Spirit. And I find all too frequently that those who are belittling others for not going and for not being evangelistic is something that they themselves are guilty of. For out of the abundance of their heart, their lying mouth is speaking. And they try to afflict you and accuse you of that for which they are guilty. And you wonder, well, how many Waffle Houses have you been sitting at drinking coffee while we've been out trying to get the gospel to others? Dear soul, I don't know of any other church that has been as evangelistic as this church is. When the cassette tape was, uh, was in, when that was all we had, when it was popular, we were sending out tapes free of charge all over this nation and all over this world. We were sending tapes to Africa and, and all places. We even had some tracks show up at a, 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 at a, a, a flea market in, in, uh, in, in Russia. A man wrote us from Russia saying he, he, he bought one of our tracks. I don't know why they were selling them in, in, in Russia. And then we had a ministry opened up to us through one of the members of our church who was able to get our tapes into truck stops. And as one trucker would hear them and believe and want others to know them, they would say, give us some more and we're going to put them in a truck stop up here or over there. We had gospel preaching going out everywhere. And these truckers could ride down the road listening to the gospel being preached. It is amazing. Then we wrote up our messages 
the, the messages, not sermons, the messages that God gave us. We pinned them down and sent out a monthly book of nothing but recorded messages of the Word of God because we felt like that Jesus Christ was Lord, that Jesus Christ is presently reigning Lord, and that we're not going to look at the harlot church. Let them enjoy the Waffle House and their coffee. I don't have time for them. And let these people who are lying on us and saying, you're not being evangelistic enough. I don't worry about them. I have to look at things that are of good report. And I think on these things. And I look at the Lord Jesus Christ and remember how He came to me at the right time, at the right place, when everybody else was convinced that I was a born-again, saved Christian. And I wasn't. I was a lost church member. Only Jesus knew that. Go ye therefore. Follow the Lord. Don't worry about these naysayers. Don't worry about these people that are not evangelizing themselves and, 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 and lying on you and say you're not evangelizing. Don't worry about it. God knows what to do with them. I ain't got time to fool with that. I got to keep on doing what God told me to do. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what God said. Listen, Matthew 15, 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now what do you conclude, Lord? In vain do they worship me. They're going through all of this commotion, all of this effort to have worship service. But God said, it don't register with me. It's in vain they do worship me because they're only teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. They left out Matthew 28, 18. They left out Ephesians 2, 10. They won't preach it. They won't hear of it. Why? <clears throat> because their deeds are evil and they don't want to have to face God. The last church I pastored before this one, and we constituted this church in, in uh, July of 1975. And I've been the pastor here for 45 years. And, and, and we found out, dear soul, that uh, the, the church before that, I, that we came here, that we came out of, couldn't stay there any, any longer. Tried our best, but they wouldn't have the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I found out was the deacons in that church, they actually counted up the number of sermons that I preached on tithing. Guess how many it was? I wasn't called to preach on tithing and get money into their coffers and make them feel as a successful church. How can you be unsuccessful in the Holy Spirit? But I wouldn't preach on it. I preached on Christ and Him crucified. That's what I felt like we need to know. Dear soul, if you seek first the kingdom of God, you seek first His righteousness, all these things will be added. God will take care of everything else if you put Him first. But religion today does not want to put Christ first. They are all too happy to leave off Matthew 28, 18. They're all too happy to leave off Ephesians 2, 10. They don't want Christ involved in it. Let's read some verses. Can you find Titus? The book of Titus comes after 2 Timothy. There's Titus, and then there's Philemon, and then the book of Hebrews. So between the book of 2 Timothy and Hebrews is the book of Titus. Paul's writing to uh, his, his friend Titus, mine own son after the common faith, he says in Titus 1.4. Let's read some verses. Titus 2.7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. You stick with Christ, and you stick with good works that Christ the Holy Spirit raises up, and it will stop the mouths of those. They'll have to invent lies to tell on you because they can't find any bad thing to say about you. Titus 3 and verse number 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Maintaining the good works that God has worked in you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who worketh in you to will and do of his good pleasure. So you work out that which God has worked in and keep on doing it. Don't ever quit. So he says in verse 14 of Titus 3, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. And while we're here at Hebrews, right here at the front door, turn on over to Hebrews 13. In verse number 21. He's talking about the God of peace, the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, there are different beliefs and different compartments of religion that you can get into, all kinds of denominations. Although the Bible says there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God and Father of us all. And there are those who believe so much in sovereignty that they... Uh, lay aside the works and say anybody that preaches on works is not of God. But we're not preaching on works for justification. We're not preaching on works in order to be saved. When you call the dog, the tail is not on his nose. When you get saved, the works come afterwards, not before. It's not of works, but it's unto good works. So, when we preach on works, there are those who say, well, we're not going to listen to him. He believes in works salvation. No, I don't. But dear soul, let me tell you this. If you don't have the works of the Holy Spirit emitted from you, you don't have the evidences of Christ being in you. James said, until Abraham had offered up Isaac, his Faith was not seen and manifest except until that work came. It was when God saw Abraham begin to take that knife to offer his son as a blood sacrifice. God said, that's enough. Now I know that you love me. Now I know that you have faith. I see thy faith by thy works. And dear soul, you cannot show your faith except by works. And you cannot show the works of God the Holy Spirit by leaving out the passages that show and manifest Jesus Christ as presently reigning Lord. You must have Matthew 28, 18 with verses 19 and 20. All authority is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye because of that and preach the gospel. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So you must not take away Ephesians 2.10 from Ephesians 2.8 and 9. And you must not take away Matthew 28.18 from Matthew, from Matthew 28.19 and 20. 
So we see this is the work of God. This is how that it is done. We are not to omit the word therefore in Matthew 28, 19. It gives us an understanding that we must be God conscious if we are to properly go ye. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.